I had an interlibrary loan person. And I came from the perspective of being a cataloger, and I was also um, working in systems. But I never worked with interlibrary loan materials at all. I knew OCLC, but I didn't know anything about Arial. I didn't know anything about Clio. And she would come to me and just basically say, my computer's not working. It's just not working. I don't understand what's wrong with it. Can you please just fix it? And it was always in this panic type mode um, whenever she'd come and talk to me about it. And she was, you know, she was scared of technology, I would say. You know, she was the type of person you had to take away the typewriter to get her to use word processing. Um, it just didn't happen otherwise. And I would sit down with her and I'd say, well, what's it supposed to be doing? And she just couldn't really articulate it. And so I spent a lot of time with this person um, just working through what her software does, what kind of files she needed, what kind of databases she needed to get access to, and why she needed them. Once we worked through all of that together, she, number one, had far fewer problems. And number two, if she had a problem, she could actually explain to me what it was. And I think that that was so important because I don't think all tech people have the time or really want to take the time to understand exactly what you need to do and why you need to do it and how to do it most efficiently and effectively. Uh, but if you, if you get people in the mindset and if you tell your staff to get in the mindset of really understanding and thinking about what they do every day, it makes a big difference when they report problems. When you report the problems, do not do this. <laughs> do not panic. <laughs> Um, and I think that that tends to be our first reaction a lot of the time. And, if, and we need to take the time to stop and think through it. I like to think of when you report problems, we're all trained as reference librarians on a certain level. I think of it from the patron's perspective. We've all had a patron come up to the reference desk if you're a librarian who has said, I need, I need one form when in actuality they really needed another. They couldn't really explain what their problem was and you had to use your reference interviewing skills to try and get the answer out of them. Um, think, about, think about that as being a patron when you go and talk to your tech staff. I think that's extremely important that you think through exactly the information you think they might need to know and as much background. It includes describing your symptoms, how they've occurred. You know, I think that another thing that we all tend to do is we tend to put things on our systems that maybe we shouldn't. And we think, well, we may not say anything to our tech people about that when they come in. They're going to find out, they're going to know, and they're going to be real mad if you haven't told them, and they spent a long time on this. So tell them if you've done it. Chances are it'll be a lot easier on you if you think that that might be the cause, to let them know about it at, at the beginning. And you know, just be aware of your surroundings. There are times when I, I'll go in to fix a computer and someone will say, yeah, for the past few weeks this has been happening. And I'm like, the past few weeks? Why didn't you talk to me about this weeks ago? And they'll just say, well, you know, I didn't want to bother you or anything. I'm like, well, now it's a huge problem. It could have been a small problem a few weeks ago. And the next thing is, you know, don't assume that you know the answer to the, your problem. I think we have patrons who come in in the reference interview who say, I really need a form just because I need to have someone pay, my, pay their rent. And really, they, want to, they probably want a forcible entry and detainer action form. But if you assume you know the, the answer to your problem, that's how, they're, that's how your IT people are going to respond. And I think I also had the perspective of people would come to me and say things like, the internet is down. And of course, my response was, in the entire world, the internet's down? You know, what do you mean by that? Um, in actuality, they might have meant their email was down. Um, they couldn't log in that morning. Uh, don't assume you know the problem. It's better, off if, it's better off for you if you describe your symptoms most of the time. And also, you know, following up, I think this is a really hard sticking point for lots of people. If your tech person hasn't told you when they're going to be able to get to the problem, go ahead and ask them at the time. Um, it's better to ask them at the time, number one, for yourself, so you don't have to give them another phone call and nag them. And number two, they don't have to hear from you again um, if they're going to be able to get back to you the next day or the day after. They may be very busy. There may be a reason they haven't told you when they'll get back to you. They may not know, but it doesn't hurt to ask right at the time when they're trying to help you solve your problem. And let them know in a timely fashion after they've returned your computer to you or they think they fixed a problem if you're still experiencing some of the same symptoms. The next part of the presentation is really about being an effective advocate, which I think is perhaps the most, part, the most important point of our communication uh, with all of our tech people because we have to let them know what, we, what types of needs we have. And, you know, being an advocate doesn't involve throwing your weight around, doesn't involve complaining, and above all, it doesn't involve going above your tech people's heads. They will remember it, I promise you. 
they will always remember it. Unless you absolutely have to, I would try and deal with the person first and foremost. But it really does involve making yourself known. And that means that when you go to live, when you go to meetings, you let people know what you're doing. You talk to them about the projects you're working on. And you also just you need to work on developing a relationship with your techies. Um, you need to be talking to them on different types of levels rather than always saying, I've got this problem or I have this need. It's a constant relationship you need to build on a daily basis um, with your technical people. So they know you, they know what kinds of issues you might have, and they can perhaps foresee, you know, once you get to know techies, they're great because they can say, hey, there may be another way that you can, you can do this thing that you've been doing the hard way for a long time. And without, that, without them knowing you really well, they're probably not going to have the information they need to do that effectively. From a networking point of view, I think some of the special needs that libraries have that we really need to communicate, first of all, are hours of operation. If they need to take the, um, if they need to take the system down to do networking maintenance, Make sure they know that you're open lots of hours, that the rest of the law school probably isn't going to be up and running. Also, it's a good idea. They don't always know what critical areas are. If the entire law school's down, if you make it known, CERC needs to go up first. Um, that's our most critical area. If you have a computer lab in your library, you've got students hounding you. It's a good idea just to make sure that they know which areas you really need help with first. From a hardware point of view, we have lots of different pieces of hardware in libraries that tend to be specific to our needs. We have a lot of different printers. We have these, we have these ILL printers for labels. We have spine label printers. We have system printers sometimes, which I personally hated, um, but we had those. Also, some of us have, are running our own OPACs at our law schools. Uh, we'll have those servers with our own special software on them. We have all sorts of different terminals. We have those dumb terminals around some of us still um, that we just can't seem to get rid of. Uh, we also have laptops um, as well as our regular desktop machines. Oh, a little crazy there. And, we, and a lot of us also do presentations, and so we have lots of different presentation pieces of hardware that we lug around with us or that we need to have in good working order. You know, and before you go out and buy that stuff, Talk to your tech people. You know, they're going to want standardization as much as possible. If you've got sharp projectors in your law school, don't go and buy another brand. Talk to your tech people first. They're really going to appreciate that, and you're really going to appreciate it when you need support. As far as software is concerned, we do more than run Telnet sessions. I was so frustrated you know, hearing, well, you don't really need more expensive machines. You know, all you guys do are run Telnet sessions. I'm like, what do you mean all we do are run Telnet sessions for a character-based OPAC? We do a lot more than that. Uh, there's a wide spectrum of the software that we use. Generally speaking, we use probably the same types of software that are used elsewhere in the, li in, in the law schools. But, but libraries specifically, we have a lot of software that maybe other people are not going to be as familiar with that do certain functions that are only specific to libraries. And that includes Clio and Arial, OCLC. And they just do lots of different things. And if they're down, you need to be able to explain why you think what's going on is happening. Um, and make sure that your tech people know that. Also, you need to work on anticipating your needs. And, that, and what I mean by that is, if you think that you've got an innovative system and you want to go up on Millennium, start talking to your tech people early on. Do not ever say, next week I want to, I'm going to go buy this software and we need to get it up and running. They'll be able to tell you if you have the hardware and software, if you'll be compatible with their needs. Also, do your own research. Um, it's really helpful if you can tell them, listen, I think there's going to be a conflict the next time we order computers. Can we be on your list um, to get the new ones? This is why we'll need them. And also be willing to take advice and to ask for it. There are times when you'll say, I'll, I would just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, we're thinking about buying this. What do you think about that? Oftentimes, as long as you know, you'd already kind of talked to them about it, they were really happy to say, oh, sure, that sounds like a great idea. Go for it. Other times they'd say, well, this will cause a problem with this, and we'd try to work together to find a solution to it. The final word about advocating for yourself, if you don't do it, no one else is going to. So you, you, I, I know it's hard to go in and say, we need this, we need this. But if you develop that relationship, you can advocate for yourself effectively. And if you learn to effectively communicate with your technical staff, no matter what their idiosyncrasies are, no matter what types of people they are, you'll really have progress will not be limited in your library and you'll be more effective technologically. 
Okay, and that's it for me. I'll check, we'll speak. Great. Is that on? Great. Oh, that was terrific. That was uh, definitely straight to the point. Uh, <laughs> I work as the computer services reference librarian at the Vermont Law School. My name's Chuck Papermeister. And I've been there for about a year and a half. Uh, this is a great position if you enjoy being uh, having a, a foot in both worlds. And uh, I do. You get to see what's going on, on the tech side, and then you get to see what's going on, on the librarian side. So being there so short, I thought it would be uh, the, the idea struck me to actually tap the resources we have at the school. We, um, I'm not sure of the exact count, but we have probably uh, about a century's worth of experience from the librarians that have been there. So I talked to them about that, and I said, uh, you know, when we have meetings, uh, librarian meetings, one of the most animated discussions always seems to be around technology. You know, what are we going to do about handhelds? What are we going to do about wireless? What are we going to do about uh, the internet? And uh, so I decided that I would interview them, and I taped it uh, on a digital digital videotape. I shouldn't say tape, digital video. And so I've got it right here. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, there were some librarians that were, due to scheduling, uh, not able to be on, but uh, we've got three um, out of five, so let's see how that goes. And we have tech support here. <laughs> ah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. All right, all right, all right. I might need to reboot it. That frees up. Uh -huh. There we go. Fires. Uh, 
Uh, and when you're busy putting out fires, you're not often explaining to, pe to the people watching how the fire started, how we're going to put the fire out. You're busy putting the fire out. I'd say 25% of the people skills. For 19%. Right. Um, a few years ago, at the law librarians of New England meeting, the, the purpose of the meeting was to help IT people and librarians work better together. And part of that was taking an abbreviated test to determine personality types. Um, and I think the librarians were really excited about it. We were all there. And I don't know if there were any IT people that came to that at all. As <coughs> Um, and I would say 20%. I think about a quarter. I think about a quarter. I think that uh, because of the, the struggle of having to get a lot of work done, uh, their life might be a lot easier if they uh, learned how to deal with troublesome librarians, uh, faculty, students. Uh, librarians who had uh, library school training have had some actual coursework in sort of the reference interview, uh, how to find out from people what it is that they're uh, trying to say. Do a lot better. <laughs> I think, you know, what's interesting to me is um, that there are no, or, or I'd say very, very few uh, occasions where librarians and IT people actually meet and talk about, you know, what, what each other needs from the other, or maybe even what people's projects are that they're working on and how they could help each other. We could do amazing things. We really could do amazing things. The internet is getting better and better all the time. I can't help but think that if some of these inter if some of these internet um, companies, these people who are putting up internet sites, if they would involve information professionals in creating, and when I say information professionals, I'm talking about librarians. That some of the sites which are the best sites are sites which have librarians involved in developing them, like Find Law. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, yes. Yes, <laughs> they should be considered the information professionals, information managers, how about I am people? The information managers. <coughs> if we changed our name to information manager, we'd get a lot more respect, um, and it would reflect in a much better way what we're really doing, which is managing information. Right. Wondering how the IT people got information in their title, information technology. I could see them being the T people. <laughs> <laughs>
And I have been helping people access information. I've been teaching people how to access information for that entire time. And I think we could have people, uh, we could help the IT folks to better understand how people approach um, in information, how they approach sources to try to find information. We're both highly skilled professions. Um, IT people are really strong in technology. We're really strong in information and instruction. That we're available as resources and librarians can uh, take up that slack that, uh, of the many, many things that they see. Computer technology people are so busy bailing water so that the good ship computer technology can, can float, then uh, some of that thinking about where we ought to be going uh, in terms of what the information needs of the institution are, I think uh, could be served by the librarian. The goal in an academic institution is not to have computers run. They're to educate law students. They're to uh, help people with the, uh, their research needs from the library's point of view. Uh, so I think the, the librarians can have a lot to say about uh, where they see that aspect of uh, information technology going. Uh, I think we probably don't tell the IT folks enough how much we appreciate them. Uh, we certainly uh, could not run as an institution uh, without good IT people. I think we've been lucky, uh, particularly in our last few years at Vermont Law School, that we've hired good people on the IT side. Uh, so I think the, the one thing that they probably don't know that they ought to know is that we appreciate you know, the good work that they've done for the institution. Um, I guess I would like to thank uh, the librarians that were willing to do that interview. I think that takes a lot of guts, and uh, I really do appreciate that. I also uh, appreciate our, our IT uh, folks at the school uh, were willing to help me out a lot in getting that together, uh, despite the fact that we were basically talking about them. Uh, so that's great. I'd like to thank the IT folks here, too, just to get that thing running was not, not all that easy. Um, I'd take any questions before passing it on, if anyone's got one. Is this on the web? I think it's being broadcast. No, but I mean. Uh, the the tape. Uh, we'll put it on the web. If you let yeah. us, we'll put it on the web. I think sure. if we were showing other people. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes. I'd just like to throw on my own set of the a practice of librarians. Uh, when I uh, went to uh, library school, which was a very long time ago, every single course I took had a common name that was different from its formal name. You know, information resource is what we call it preference. Uh, and I'm afraid we, uh, librarians may, may be trying to uh, do, the, do that again. So, just not, not being substantive. Well, uh, a rose by any other name is still a librarian. Right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Your turn, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I'm Billy Jo Kaufman, and I'm the director of the Law Library and Technology Center at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, when I first saw this as a uh, potential topic for Cali, I said, well, it should have a subtitle, Techies are from Mars, Librarians are from Venus. Uh, but in thinking about it, and I'm going to share some experiences that highlight some of what's been said previously, but how we moved from, from what I would have considered a very traditional library uh, to a, a very high-tech um, situation uh, moving from one person in commuter, computer services to eight in about nine months uh, and tell you some of the things that we learned and some of the virtual reality checks that we made. Um, first, we realized that when we hired six new folks in technology, 
uh, while the librarians were standing on the sidelines, the technology was getting a huge uh, chunk of change, uh, a lot of attention, and we did this in not the best way. Uh, the librarians were involved, and, and certainly we talked about it at meetings, but clearly we almost created our own we, they. So we had to move to change that message right away and let the librarians and the technology folks know what the real goals were, what the mission was, why the law school was doing this, uh, and what the administrative efforts and the faculty efforts were. Um, also, of course, a lot of what we were doing looked like toys if you didn't have them. So if um, one of the techies came in with his new first Palm Pilot and the librarian was still using her old you know, 1088 uh, computer, somehow they didn't see that that was neat. Um, so we spent a long time talking about what the goals were, and as was said previously, our goals were our both service, whether you're uh, working at the reference desk, whether you're working at interlibrary loan, whether you're in AV services. The goal is to provide services to our users, whether it's faculty, staff, students, um, outsiders, guests, and we tried to work on having workshops of, of what service really meant. Now I think still the librarians have a much higher level of service orientation and thinking um, than maybe the techies started out with, but clearly some of it is putting out fires and it makes it a little difficult for them. We also moved from the it's not my job to a, a mentality of let me see if I can help you or let me direct you to the right person. Uh, we found that even the folks at reference could handle some very basic technology questions. And um, that was no surprise at all, but the reference librarians actually started fielding some of those and wouldn't even send them up to computer services, uh, which seemed to begin building some of those bridges. If they could handle uh, setting up a default or a browser, they just went ahead and did it. And it gave the librarians a sense of being a part of the technology picture. Uh, both prior speakers and even our uh, moderator spoke about the importance of communication. And one thing that we realized were the techies didn't really understand what background and degrees and, and how much and how many years librarians had been working with technology. They, they thought they'd invented technology and most of us who are librarians know that you know, as many as 20, 25 years ago with the first OCLC terminals, we were the very first people that used technology uh, in the whole law school. And at our law school, the library was the first place that got a fax machine. So we tried to give them some of that information and background. Uh, we realized that on an individual basis, the, the techies and the librarians didn't know too much individually about each other. When we did hiring, the hiring committee or the search committee for that position knew that person's strengths and expertise, but the whole staff didn't know their strengths and expertise. So we do things like when we publish our Tidbytes electronic library newsletter, we focus on a staff member or a technology member and include their background. And, and, and it's not so much to tell the whole law school population as much as it is to tell each other about the skill sets and background folks have. Um, most of our jobs, whether it's information management or technology management, are really problem resolution. And we try to, to deal with those on a really good basis. Um, we had speakers who came in and worked on showing the different skill sets uh, that each person came to. Um, some of us don't want to take, a, take apart the ball joints, uh, and we do just want them fixed, and we're very appreciative that there's someone else to do that. And so we tried to, to recognize that everyone came to the table with a certain amount of skill sets and a certain amount of expertise. One major change that we made, we'd always had uh, library faculty liaisons, where librarians were assigned to certain faculty members and administrative offices to provide information and reference uh, research. We now do the same thing with technology, and all the technical staff is assigned to so many faculty members and so many administrative units because 
we want them to know the right person to go to. We, we want people to realize, you know, don't call the network administrator if, if what you need is um, an AV a projector set up. And so we've tried to educate and communicate what people's individual expertises are and how to get to the right person the first time. Um, Carl, your I thought was interesting. Who said, you know, we need to thank thank the techies, and 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 I, I think we need to thank the librarians too. So one of the things that we did, we realized that everybody did their work all day, but we weren't together very often, and we um, plan a number of events uh, through the year that are. They're fun, uh, they're a chance for people to get together to learn more about each other uh, and do some kind of frost fertil fertilization, I guess, of, of what each person's bringing. Um, we have some times of our year which are unbelievable uh, with the amount of work. When we do laptop training for 320 people the week of August 13th, I can tell you on the on August 16th, people are tired, and we, we try to reward that. We build special monies into the budget to reward that, uh, and we reward everyone because everyone takes part, and, and we've tried to uh, do a whole lot of explaining why each spoke in that wheel is important to, to the, the whole um, mechanism. Um, the last thing, um, I knew that I was in the right panel when I got a report from Edu Edutech, uh, I don't know if all of you are familiar with this publication, it's the Education Technology Newsletter for Faculty and Administrators, but it has a whole section on knowing your techies, and it talks about um, things from basic skill sets to independence and, and ways that they'd like to be left alone on certain things and uh, like to be included on other things, but I would highly recommend it because it gives a little insight uh, into um, really where techies are coming from. And, and we all come from some place, and I thought this was an excellent article. Thank you. We've all got our subtitle. <laughs> I'd like to take an opposite view of the love fest that uh, Billy's just talked about. Um, and I'd also uh, like to tell you I'm in a military sort of mind, and that's why the, the titles are here. And that's also why you'll see these lovely <laughs> graphics. A uh, comment about the graphics. It looks like Southern Illinois has no budget whatsoever for graphics. What I'm hoping instead is that in light of the recent New Yorker uh, profile of PowerPoint, that you'll think of this as delightfully retro when we're going through the particular <laughs> graphics over here. I started at Southern Illinois in 1988, and I've been of reference and computer services librarian up until 98 when I took over director of IT for the law school and the library as well. And it's been interesting, to say the least. So I've looked at things, let's see, we gotta push it this way. Looked at them <laughs> from both sides. I know how librarians feel, and I know how techies feel, and sometimes they like each other, and sometimes they don't. And the point of this, I assume, was to talk to you about uh, what techies should know. And at the end, I have a few comments about what librarians should know about techies, so that we're all covering the bases themselves. OK, what techies should know. I have four basic points. Communication, we've talked about over and over again. Library structure and organization, databases and services, and budget policies. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of those. First off, communication. Email versus a really nice live voice. Techies say, when you have a problem, what do you do? Send me an email. What do librarians say? It's not working. Well, it's not only that, it's I can't tell you everything about 
in an email. I have to be able to use my hands in order to tell you what's wrong with the computer. So as techies, we need to remember that uh, sometimes you just have to listen to a real voice saying what the problem is. And yes, I know you can just sit there and tap your foot and all, but you need to listen to what's being said because librarians like to paint a picture of what's going on. Correct. OK, library jargon. Uh, techies need to know some of that stuff. And librarians are guilty of it. Oh, go fix the OPAC. You know, what's on OCLC? Especially when people are new in the law, the law school field or the library field, they don't know what you're talking about. Um, so it, it does good to at least have someone explain it to you as you're going through. IT jargon, same thing. Um, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times our IT staff has tried to diagram out <laughs> the way the internet enters the law school. Um, the router, the whole the MAU, the router. And our director will just sit there and say, okay, you spent 10 minutes talking about it, and now tell me what you really mean. And if you're not able to put it in layman's terms, then you're not going to get your point across. And finally, for those computer snoots who roll their eyes at the mouse lexic, that's called natitude, and you've got to get rid of it. Um, otherwise, you're never, ever going to be uh, truly there to help, which is what IT is there. Um, above all, you're there to help. If it weren't for problems, you wouldn't exist. And you need to be able to be there to help people with it. So uh, to quote that library saying, if you're a techie and you don't understand what's being said about the library, just do what that library is saying is, just ask. And make sure that you feel comfortable in asking, but make sure you do ask. Otherwise, you're never going to learn it. And the librarians are just going to look at you and say, well, they don't really care about my, my issue or my problem. So make sure you do that. OK, secondly. You met the enemy, and the enemy is the library, of course, <laughs> uh, when you're looking at IT. And what I mean by that is, know who's who in the organizational charts. Um, I have some tech staff that, when they first started, the director of the library versus the uh, interlibrary loan staff member. ILL staff member brought in their laptop to have something fixed. Not a good idea anyway. The director of the law library had a major problem with the database. Which one do you think should be helped first? Well, they chose the wrong one. <laughs> uh, so you need to make sure that you know who's who in the library organization. And know what the library's mission is. What is it that we do as a library? At, at my school, we have a strong self-help uh, collection. And we help an awful lot of pro se people, both on the street and through our website. Um, a recent problem with one of our tech people was our administrative code in the state of Illinois up until recently was only available on CD-ROM. And the tech person decided, well, you have Lexis and Westlaw. You don't need the CD-ROM. So I'm not going to load it for the, the next eight months. Um, first of all, the fact that the librarians didn't notice that it hadn't been loaded in eight months is probably not a good thing. But secondly, there was no way for non-law students, uh, non-faculty to get access to primary law of our state. So it's really not up to the tech person to make the decision about what should be loaded. Um, it needs to be coordinated with the library itself. And respect that library service orientation. I mean, that's what we're there about, to provide service. And um, I was thinking about what if I had interviewed uh, my staff uh, about their comments. And, and I suspect many of the words would have been unprintable, much less <laughs> up there. So I did a lot of editing. Okay. <laughs> but you need, techies need to respect what the library is doing. Yes, sir? Let's say the library is the one with service that they want to present to themselves. And they're offering all these services to the public. And then all of a sudden, they have issues related to faculty and the dean or whatever else that aren't being met because of their public mission. Mm -hmm. they take it on themselves. So who makes the determination whether or not to take a sheet down perform the public mission or maintain the library? It sure is a balancing awesome. act. What, what do you do and, and who's going to make that decision? Ultimately, it'll be the dean who makes the decision um, unless you have a very strong library director and the IT staff is based in the library and reports to the library director. And Let's then you the IT staff reports to a CIO doesn't need to report to the library. Then the library will either need to hire their own people, if they can do that, and at least have people that can work with the law school's IT, or they're going to have to uh, buy an awful lot of donuts. 
and make sure that you know they grease the, the pump and make sure that their actions are, are done, their projects are, are on the table as well. But yeah, it is a balancing act, and it's always going to be that way. Okay, uh, library staff and tech staff, just to make the point, do we fight each other or do we work together? Some other retro graphics just so you can look at this. Uh, <laughs> moving on, you really aren't the weakest link as techies. Um, you really do need to learn something about, especially law libraries, Lexis and Westlaw, and some of the databases that are out there. Otherwise, you can't adequately troubleshoot when you're going through it. So, you know, get a password for your techies. Um, make sure that they have some rudiments. Invite them to some of the training that you offer, so that you know if they have some intellectual curiosity, and some of them do, um, you can at least feed that and also provide a needed service at the same time. Um, your online catalog, if it goes down, that's another service um, that I think should take priority over just about anything. If your OPAC is down in your library, what are you doing? Um, you're really not doing much except going out to the shelves and, and pushing people towards books. Um, so that has to be a priority, especially from the library point of view, and that has to be made clear to your technical people when you're going through it. And uh, library services on a broader scope do affect more people than certain projects, uh, certain pet projects of certain faculty members. So even if your associate dean does have that wonderful printer he bought um, on eBay that never worked since day one and has made sure that your tech people are just in his office every day trying to get it fixed, you need to make sure that they understand the, the wider picture, which is as librarians and library services do affect more than just one particular faculty member at a time. Um, we're your friends, basically. Uh, we're in the same business, as everybody's pointed out. We're all in that access to information materials. OK, and the last part, um, take some time to learn about library procedures. In my shop, the IT people, the staff that work under me, are under the library itself. And we're in a credit card age where you just buy off the web with a credit card, and, and you'll get the stuff in two days. That's not how it works at state institutions, of course, and especially in <laughs> library budgets where, um, boy, I'm hoping this isn't being webcast in my home school, but we do have uh, staff that order materials, and they don't like, they have a, a university credit card with their name on it. They don't like using it on the web for anything. Um, and that's one of their bugaboos. They just don't like using, even though it's a university credit card, they don't like using credit cards on the web at all. So we can't use that to order materials. We have to go outside the realm. And when your system's down, it's because you need to part. It can get very frustrating. Um, so you need to, to plan on that and have some extra parts, as well as with your uh, acquisitions budget. Uh, know what is going to be available out there. And work cooperative, cooperatively when you are doing training. Um, oftentimes, that. In the past couple of years, I've found that some of my techies are providing on-the-spot training, which is good initiative, but is bad because they're saying the wrong things about the particular product, or they don't know what they're talking about, or they're just making it up to get out of the office <laughs> as soon as possible. So if you can work with the library to provide training, um, either train them to train others or work together, it will make things a lot better. Above all, for all techies, this is great advice. Smile, be happy, and please be cheerful. Um, no, nothing is served by having a tech person with his head down all the time talking about how far behind he or she is, or it can't be done no matter how much money you throw at it. It just can't be done. I have. I have one techie like that, and I have one techie who just whistles while he works. <laughs> and I tell you, that when people call, you can guess who they want to talk to. You know, he, the, the second guy can whistle, and he's happy, and he jokes with you, and he may not get your computer working any faster. But people enjoy the experience working with him rather than the other person. So if you can get your tech people to be happy, this goes for librarians as well. Um, <laughs> it will make for a better relationship. And, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping there's been a crash. Okay, and some final words of advice for librarians. 
about techies now that I've been on both sides. Computers do crash all the time. Okay? It's a fact of life. It's not something that you necessarily did. It might have been something you did, but they're just going to crash. And stop blaming the tech people for the pizza <laughs> jump. It's just not something they have much control of, as I say. Techies do need to know error messages and may need to recreate the situation. What's the first thing a techie asks when you call them the that your computer's crashed? What was the error message? What's the error message say? What were you doing? What happened? And librarians take this as, you, you get an awful personal here. You know, all I want is the computer to be fixed itself. You know, but they have to do that because a lot of it is just trial and error. What, what went wrong at this particular time? Of the 40 billion error messages that are in Microsoft products, they're not really going to know that much about it. And secondly, even if you write down that error message exactly as it says on the screen of death, you know, half the time they're not going to say, oh, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> now, has anyone ever said, I know exactly what that is? <laughs> No, they're going to say, uh-huh, yeah, error message. Hmm. Well, let's reboot it and see what happens. And then tell me what else you were doing at the time you went through it. Uh, some things are out of techies control. Um, librarians need to expect that. When I first started in this business, I had a librarian tell me that she wasn't going to search the web until she had a list of the absolute best reliable websites to look at. <laughs> and she expected that out of... IT department, and I just thought, okay, this this can be a fun job. Um, <laughs> gradually, we've gotten better at that. My last point, of course, is something you all know: techies are people too. And as I said before, donuts are always appreciated. Um, making sure that you invite them to law school events, that they're part of some department, will, in the long run, help cement your relationship with them. Thanks very much. Do we have any questions or comments for some of our panelists up here? Oh, come on. What kind of donuts do you have? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> uh, it depends on the day, basically. It depends on how hard a day. The, the sprinkles always come in uh, handy. Unfortunately, we're not anywhere near a Krispy Kreme uh, franchise, which would be great. Uh, so we have to make do with the Dunkin' Donuts variety. Pizza works as well. Pizza's good. Uh, more of a comment as a librarian and a techie in much the same role. Uh, I think that librarians really have the responsibility to take some ownership. Uh, they can teach very sophisticated students very sophisticated topics. Uh, they have more higher ed than most anybody in the building, especially faculty. Uh, they speak at least three languages, English, Librarian speak and legalese, and yet if you try to explain what's happening outside of the buildings, why Westlaw is working and Lexus isn't, it's probably a Lexus problem. Again, they'll say, You just explain that to me, now tell me what you mean. Um, so, and they, and they need to distinguish between technology issues and things that involve technology. An example would be databases, um, don't call the network administrator to help you with your Lexus service. So I think that there's a more responsibility that needs to go back to the librarians because they've been involved in the information technology business from the start. And most of the techies have been in for just a few years. What is the advice uh, we could give for IT managers and directors? Uh, they have to face with uh, like a new software and hardware in the market has to be given to the faculty based on the central administration. Like Microsoft is raising something every other month, and to be in part of the other departments will be forced to do that, but then you don't have, you wouldn't have even trained the previous version uh, for, the, for the staff. So what is that advice you would give? My advice would be to be flexible when you're doing I still have a faculty member using WordPress at 5 1. And the secretary was 92 years old and died last year. And with her death, lost the last trace of anyone else knowing how to use 5 1 except for him. 
And we just found that you support it as long as you can. And when you have new material, especially in the law school, you don't force anything on law <laughs> It's just not done. Um, you work cooperatively with them. If you have an IT uh, committee, the faculty committee, the green plans and then we can talk about that. Or, as some people will say, you take it to the, the really, really technical, the technical guru law professor on the faculty who has some, some credibility uh, with the rest of the faculty and introduce that person to it. And if they like it, they'll spread the word. I also think you can get your dean involved with some of that, too. Um, I've done that in the past. If you know, I had some word perfect 5-1 people as well. And uh, my dean, I was a he was able to say, we're cutting bait on this. We're not going to do it. I'll give you a final date. Work with your tech people on getting some training. And if you can get their support, it makes your job a whole lot easier, I think. Yes. From the perspective of a techie, I'd like to uh, reemphasize something you said earlier about telling your techie what you're trying to accomplish rather than trying to try to fix the problem for your techie. After all, you called the techie for support, so let the techie help you. Um, often we respond to librarians who want to give us the last half day of the troubles they've had instead of getting to the point of what it is they want to have fixed, the specific problem that's broken, so we can move on with it. By the time we've listened to a half an hour worth of what's bad in their lives and everything else, we've already tuned them out. Um, I, I agree with that point, but it also uh, is a distinction to the point over here because a lot of times the librarians or other end users are thinking, I'm taking responsibility, and by taking responsibility, here's my problem. I need to have this particular software program to do this particular function. I've looked into it, and this is what I need. And they're not looking more globally as to what the problem is. So it, those two ideas do work against each other, I think, putting the end user in kind of a funny situation. We've worked on a service manager approach where, you know, like you go to Sears and you have a service manager who <laughs> talks to the customer and holds her hand and, and sympathizes with them. And then you have the real people that are doing the actual work. Um, we have some faculty that do exactly what you want. They want to tell you the last 50 years worth of problems they have with the computer and waste your time. And when you're rolling your eyes, you're becoming that computer snoop that I talked about. So what we generally do is I go down and, and become a service manager and talk to the faculty member and say, okay, I, gosh, I'm sorry these things have happened. Let's see if we can get you scheduled for service, so to speak. And then we send the tech person down later on to deal with the issue. But some of it is finessing it. But you know, I understand your point, but they just get madder and madder if you roll your eyes or you act like you don't have time to listen to them. Because you know, faculty members and even librarians like to talk. <laughs> I'd like, to, I'd like to say something more about that, too. <laughs> You'd like to think that you have time to listen to people, and but the reality is, is when you've got tons of material pressing down on you, you don't have time. And I think librarians typically are very good people, persons, and while that's a, it's a, it's a generalization, I know that myself as a, as a techie person, I often come across as a very bad people person. We, we, hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because I am in a hurry, because I do have five other things to get to this, this hour, and I need to get right to the point. And as, as librarians can, must be able to sympathize with, anytime anyone comes to you for support on anything, they also think that you're their counselor, that you're their loan advisor, that you're their, you know, they, they want to re switch in their mortgage and talk to you about it, and everything like that. So. It, if, if there's an understanding between people that when there's business to be done, that we're talking about business, and that you know, on the breaks we can be nice to each other and, and chat, chat about the weather and this sort of thing, but when it comes to solving a problem, that's what I'm there to do, and everyone's comfortable with that. We're okay. I mean, I'm not talking about ignoring pleasantries entirely, but I mean, there's got to be some points at which everyone in the building realizes that people are there to do a job, and you don't expect them to to be everything else that they're not recognizing their own personality limitations as well as the typical, sort of stereotypical. Um, Especially for those people that are really talkative, what we'll do is try to find out when they're on vacation. We <laughs> 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 will schedule the work so you won't have to be around and, and do it then. And that way you're in and you're out. Coming in 7 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. Those wonders mm -hmm. working on those computers. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, in the last few years, I have it often from barbarians that they transition, that they move from a traditional library to a high-tech library. Uh, but it was never clear to me what the difference that is. How do like what are the defining features of a high-tech library? And at the same time, or in the same breath, they say what components were we thinking. So it is the first ones that are happening today too. So what does all of that mean? What what is a high-tech library? And when you were involved in, in this transition, did you include the T people in in this transition? And because that is I, I information is not only in the library, it's not doesn't really belong to the library, that is there is there are you know uh, uh, the other and the services has information, the admissions has information. All of these are the responsibility of the IT people in the, in the college. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is that is there, is, there is a gap that exists between the library when they talk about information and the IT people when they talk about the information. And usually the librarians think that is, you know, the tech people, they have to do with the network and with the hardware, and information is really not their domain. And, and, and that sometimes causes friction, that is, you know, the IT people are just the mechanics, or just as it was mentioned, the IT people, the T people. Uh, but there is more to it than there. But again, my basic question is that is, how do you define a hard tech library? What is it? What are the features of a hard tech library? Are you directing that at me? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think at, at, at my particular library, it's, it's a, a movement, uh, just like you said, career services, uh, at, at my location, the tech people are, are in the library. They're not a separate department. And we provide services to the entire law school uh, and, and to the library uh, and to individual students and to individual faculty and secretaries and everyone. But, but the difference, I think, between the basic library, we now have to have technical assistance to get to make sure our electronic databases are put up and on the web. And things that we used to buy in print, we're now buying in electronic format. And, and we can purchase them and, and decide whether we want to acquire them and select them as librarians. But we now have to make sure that we have cooperation and uh, technical assistance to make sure that what we bought can now get put up on the web for our users and that sort of thing. So things that we used to be able to do totally independent of technical help, we have to cooperate and depend and include them in those purchases and meet with those vendors uh, right from the start. And, and you're absolutely right. Those, those people have to be in those meetings uh, because we can't agree to buy something that we can't support or put up. Anybody else? <laughs> I'd like to comment. Okay. Is that I've gone to a lot of law strategy meetings now. And what we've done is we've looked at libraries. We've talked to a lot of librarians. And what I never find is a librarian that says, we need to remove more books and add more technology. And they always want the technology, but they don't want it to have any compromise on removing books. In fact, they want more space for more books as collections grow. So when I go to these meetings and I say, well, we can provide this technology, we move two floors in the library, use that for law school access, it doesn't go over. We have to provide software solutions. That's why you're only two things. But I imagine one of the head people in the strategy around. So some of the decisions I'm making like that are going to be affecting the library. And I think that anybody in the library is functioning the way they are right now with the idea that books are going to be there forever and the library is going to continue to grow, that's not going to happen. It's going to change, especially where we are. Yes, it is. 
some yeah. things are never going to be made in electronic format. So. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a topic for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else?